uh, event. We are very honored to have such wonderful people in this room. We are very honored to welcome Swami Radhanath Ji in our midst and having an uh, opportunity to hear him. It's the mountain that came to Mahama. <laughs> and we are really looking forward to that. And um, um, from this humble beginning, I think great things will happen where people will learn more about our legacy, our human legacy of devotion, of um, how to live in this world and the next. And um, I think it will be a profound evening and we are all very um, fortunate to be a part of it. It's a great center. We have the likes of Mr. Reeves Porterville, Rita G, and the great faculty they have there. There are many students from here today. I think uh, we learn more and we realize the great legacy, the human legacy <coughs> that has been left. My definition of bhakti is to see that power in everyone, in all beings. Vedas say there is nothing but him, or everything is, with, is him. And with that outlook, you really cannot be petty, selfish, or angry and not see what happened in Paris today. So I think we have, with this devotional path, there are answers to world's smallest and the biggest problems. And we are very privy, very fortunate people to be here today. Hare Krishna. Um, I would like to now invite, we're very fortunate to have with us, um, President Reese Potterbelt, the President of the Graduate Theological Union, and uh, Reverend Alan Kelchner, Vice President of the Graduate Theological Union. Um, President Potterbelt, would you be kind enough to come and say a few words about our institution? Try not to snap you with uh, <laughs> liquid shocks. Um, again, welcome tonight. And we're so glad you could come and be part of this. I'll just say a couple of things about the Graduate Theological Union. It's um, it's a graduate school, as uh, Rita was saying, for master's degrees and PhD degrees, PhD degrees, and began in 1962. And it was from the very beginning ecumenical and interfaith, but it was a little slow developing the interfaith dimension. So we finally had a center for Jewish studies in 68, an institute of Buddhist studies in 1985, Islamic studies in 2007, and now um, we've been very fortunate that in the last year and a half we've added this wonderful center for Hindu studies we have a program in Jain studies, and we have our first courses in the Sikh religion, and we're chasing others um, as well. We have some courses in Taoism and Confucianism from the Chinese traditions. So and we're can't be done until the, the table is surrounded by all of the great world religions and, and wisdom traditions. 
And then um, the excitement is that day after day, week after week, month after month, um, students and scholars, but also communities, will be involved in sharing um, dialogue, engagement, and resources about, as we've said, not only the religious traditions, but how they interact with the really difficult, challenging problems that we face as civilization. So it's, um, it's very exciting to be there, and this center has been, um, uh, yeah, I feel like my foot is now tied to the accelerator because um, as you see new traditions come and gather on the table, it adds a richness and evokes us a sense of excitement and mystery um, about um, all of the religions together and what could be possible. So hope this is a very good evening. Thanks. Shankaracharya 
has written the Bhavani Ashtakam. And the Bhavani Ashtakam says, I fear Mahadukha Bhirubhu. I fear great suffering. Jale Chanale Parvate Shatru Madhye. In the midst of flood and fire and lost in the mountains in the midst of my enemies, I turn to you, my only refuge. The word Bhavan, Bhavani in this case, is the great goddess to him, but the, the word also is of course coming out of Bhavan as a place to go, as a place for refuge. Saying, Arani Sharani. He is asking for protection. He is looking for love. This is the same person who has written the Nirvana Shadow. How come? How come? Can't you just jump to consciousness? Can't you just jump to Dhyana? No, you can't. Because the biggest, most enormous obstacle in our path to any realization is ahankar. It's not just the ego. Ahankar really is ahankara, the eye maker, the creation of a self, individual, independent, unrelated self that has no relationship to anything greater than it felt the bag of bones and skin, and that is what we limit ourselves to. Creating a self out of that, that is ahamkara. That is ahamkara. There is no way to cross the ocean of ahamkara without bhakti. That is why even a vacant, even yogis, not only start with bhakti, but circle back to bhakti. Enlightened beings circle back to bhakti so that that enlightenment does not remain something in splendid isolation, but brings them into intimate contact, not only with the divine Lord, but all his creation. Because how do you serve the Lord who needs nothing from you. Doesn't even need a leaf or a petal or a little bit of water. How do you serve the Lord who is infinity itself? You serve the Lord through serving the Lord's creation. And one of the things that Bhakti allows you to do is to flood your being with the kind of love that overflows into service for creation and cosmos and creature. <coughs> Nowhere is this seen more clearly and explicitly in our present time than the work of His Holiness, Radhanath Swami Maharaj. Now, there is a lot of seva going on in various parts of the world, service going on in India. It's all good. However, when this seva becomes sadhana, a great inner transformation takes place. What Swamiji has managed to do is turn seva into sadhana. So that that ocean can be crossed by the boat of seva. The seva, the boat, is made of the wood of shraddha, of bhakti. Without the love of bhakti, the wood is not there to create the boat. 
But the tools to create the hope are based in our ancient sampradayas. This is very important. This is very important. This is why when people who are not of Indian origin enter the Hindu world, they enter it vast majority of the times through a sampradaya. That's what provides the tools <coughs> and the components to create that boat of bhakti that takes us across that ocean. When service takes place, seva takes place, it's always good. But when it takes place with the foundation being bhakti, you have built something, a structure, with a solid foundation. <coughs> If it just takes place because you think, well, it's a good thing to do, it's good. I don't know how solid it is. I don't know if it will last. I don't know if you'll be able to transmit it in perpetuity. That is what a sampradaya is. But then the sampradaya needs a transmitter, someone who doesn't just teach the tradition, Someone who transmit it, can transmit it mind to mind and by example. We are blessed and graced to have with us this evening such a being. It is very rare that our classical sampradayas can reach down into their foundation and understand the depth of the implication of it is not just mukti but it is prema, karuna, daya, love, compassion, mercy. And that is bhakti. That is the power of bhakti. I am involved, uh, because I'm director of uh, the Center for Dharma Studies, I am called upon, and even before that I was involved in interfaith, called upon to a lot of interreligious events. And the interesting thing is, we often get one question. We're asked, there's an interfaith panel, and we're asked, everyone's asked this question, what do you do when you have the dark night of the soul? What do you do when you lose faith? What do you do when you doubt the very existence of anything divine? And I'm always confounded by this question and become speechless. And those of you who know me know that that is very rare. <laughs> so the reason I'm speechless is how do I explain to them that sadhana grounded in bhakti cannot doubt. It cannot doubt. It never doubts. Because the divine is with you every step of the way. Wherever you are, there is the Lord. And therefore, how can you doubt? You cannot. Does it matter the darkest night of your soul? You may be doubting yourself or your capacity, but you cannot doubt the Lord's presence. And thereby, you cannot doubt that you'll be lifted out. You cannot <coughs> doubt that you will be shown the mirror of your best self. That is the power of Bhakti. That is what is embodied in this remarkable book. That is what is embodied by this remarkable being. And so I would like to uh, remind you of one of these many sources of seva that has been founded and developed by Radhana Swami Maharaj, and one that I'm particularly interested in because my field is ecology and Hinduism, the intersection between ecology, ecolo environmental work, environmental consciousness, 
and the Hindu tradition and its resources. <coughs> so this particular project is the one that was on the screen before we started our program. And it is the Golwardhan Eco Village in Maharashtra. And it is really the first Hindu eco village in India. There are others, but they're not based in these very complex, yet beautiful principles. That is articulated through Krishna Bhakti, through Ram Bhakti, through the Bhakti tradition as a whole. So you have a fantastically advanced, technologically advanced project based on principles that transcend time, place, space, nationality. I would like to now introduce to you someone who um, I have known for many years and who is known to many of you as Garuda Prabhu, and known to many of us as Graham. Professor Graham Schweig is the translator of the Bhagavad Gita, which Houston Smith, the most famous scholar of religion for most of the last century, and this one, has said will never be surpassed. Such a translation will never be surpassed. It's the Gita that I always teach from, because it carries the heart of bhakti and jnana and yoga within it. He's also well known for another book, The Dance of Divine Love. It's a book that makes accessible the complexity <coughs> of the Rasa Mandala, of the Srimad Bhagavatam. He is now translating the Yoga Sutra, and his work in both outreach to the community as well as scholarship is legendary. Please join me in welcoming Professor Graham Schweig, Garuda Prabhu.